So I'm going to go ahead and get started with the introduction of Dr. Heather Kurt Ballard. Um, Heather was actually a student of mine long ago. Um, she was a great student, enjoyed having her in a class, and now we're very fortunate to have her back uh, with us here in the Ag Center and in the School of Plant and Environmental Soil Sciences. Um, so she's a, an assistant professor now. Um, her research and extension program is quite varied. Um, she does all of the Get It Growing programs. As you know, you've seen her on TV. Um, she does a wonderful job with those, um, but she also is focusing her research on consumer horticulture. So if you get some questions about consumer horticulture, your purchases of plants, um, that's Heather doing the work um, of a consumer horticulturist and trying to find out more information about how consumers work with the and how important that industry is to um, the horticulture that we do every day. The other thing Heather is working on is also medicinal plants. So part of her uh, PhD degree was working at Pennington, uh, looking at medicinal plants, and so we're very fortunate to have her working in that area as well. But today, she's going to actually talk about native plants, native plants that you can have in your yard that are gonna draw uh, wildlife and all those wonderful butterflies that we're seeing out there right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Heather get started. So good, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me here today. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about are native plants. Like Jeff said, um, my graduate research was in medicinal plants. Often the plants that we use as medicine are our native plants, but they can be used in our landscapes to um, draw in wildlife. They can be used to place replace non-natives and, and it's just a fun topic for me to talk about. So let's go ahead and get started. Before we understand where we're going, we must understand where we are. And when you look at Louisiana land types, we're made up of nine different types of land types. We have bottomland hardwoods, swamp hardwoods, coastal marsh, southeast pine and hardwoods, northwest pine and hardwoods, longleaf flatwoods, historic longleaf, upland hardwood, and coastal prairie. So um, Baton Rouge intersects at the southeast pinewood hardwood and bottomland hardwood with a smidge of upper hand, up, upland hardwood. And a little bit further to our west, um, Baton Rouge is also part of our uplands and natural levee areas. So we go a little further to the west, to West Baton Rouge Parish, and we move into more swampland. So as you can see here, um, the plants that grow in these areas are what, um, are what we can utilize as the native plants that in our landscapes. Um, but Louisiana at one time was had a historical range of coastal prairie in an area stretching from Louisiana into Texas. The Cajun Prairie area lies northeast of Lake Charles and north and northwest of Lafayette. Three of Louisiana's parishes form this region, Acadiana Parish, Evangeline Parish, and St. Landry Parish. And um, at one time, this made up 2.5 million acres in southwest Louisiana, but in 1999, we have less than 100 acres left of Cajun Prairie. So let's, I'm sorry about that, let's talk about what is a native plant. This is a photo here, it's actually um, at the museum, the New Orleans Museum of Art, it's called Louisiana Indians Walking Along a Bayou, and um, this is adapted from Tammany Bumgardner's a Bumgarten's uh, slide that she shared with me talking about what exactly is a native plant. So if you take a look at this uh, slide here, you can see many of the plants that we utilize in our landscapes. Crepe myrtles, uh, Japanese magnolias, gardenias, camellias, uh, azaleas, Chinese mahonia, Japanese yew, Indian hawthorn. Um, if you notice, what do these names say about our plants? So Asian plants do well in Louisiana. And the reason that is, is because they are, we are on the same latitude as Asia. And so when we think about our plants that we use, 
What does your name say? A common name and your Latin name of the plants often indicate the geographic origins of our plants. So some of our non-natives that we use again are Camellia japonica, Japan, uh, Rhododendron indica, which is from India, Indian hawthorn, Cleara japonica, Japanese boxwood, Japanese holly fern, Wisteria chinensis. You get the idea, right? Some of our native plants though, you'll notice those names, Itea virginica, Calicarpa americana, um, just to name a few, Quercus virginianus. Um, so our, the names of our plants often indicate from where they come from. Now, here's what a traditional landscape looks like, right? We're all kind of used to this. It's a, a typical foundation planting. Beds are straight across the front of our house. They typically contain evergreen so that there's an evergreen interest so that we have color year round. And then what makes up the rest? Typically turf grass, right? Lawns. Most of our homes today are made up of about 75% or more of lawn with the foundation plants surrounding the frame of the house. And most of the vegetative plants that are used are 80, 90, maybe 100% exotic vegetation. So it, our homes have become just the definition of a monoculture and just uniformity across the board. And this is what I think about when I think about, uh, you know, landscapes in, in America. I love this little meme that says, one does not schedule a perfect lawn. A perfect lawn schedules you, right? So how many of you feel like this in your life? Adult peer pressure, seeing your neighbor pull out their lawnmower, right? You think, oh my gosh, got to go pull out the lawnmower so I can keep up with Mr. Jones over here. Don't want my, my lawn to be unmanicured, right? So if you ever feel like this in your life, how many of you mow your lawn every single week on the same day every single week? Unless there's a hurricane coming like Sally, right? Then you go out and you mow twice for good measure so that you 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 know when your lawn becomes waterlogged, you, you're not going to be able to mow it again for quite some time. But it, I just laugh looking at these uh, My Blue Heaven, you know, and Chevy Chase on Funny Farm. It's That's our typical American lifestyle, right? keeping up that lawn. Well, this is the lot actually next door to my house uh, in a neighborhood that has never been developed. And, uh, you know, look at it, just pristine grass that has to be mowed every week because uh, just like all of the other lawns, um, Adam, you have to have this cut at least every two weeks or else you're going to be fined by your HOA, right? Can't have vegetable rows in the landscape. Uh, you get fined for your weeds. Um, so most of us are familiar with this just monoculture of a lawn. And for those of you out there right now suffering from sod webworms, right? It has become rampant across the state. You're wishing that you had less lawn and more natives. So um, let's talk a little bit about habitat fragmentation, urban, suburban developments, along with agricultural lands, um, have provided many benefits to us as humans. But this development has also created habitat fragmentation for our wildlife. You just look at these typical, you know, neighborhoods that have house after house after house and, and farmlands that uh, maybe have some trees in, in one small area, you see this picture here of Baton Rouge, the capital and all of our buildings. Where do our wildlife go? So, well, we do have national parks, right? National parks, state parks, motivated by philosophers like uh, Henry David Thoreau and activists like John Muir and politicians like Theodore Roosevelt and Gifford Pen Pinchot. Sorry, I may have mispronounced that. Uh, in 1872, Congress created the national park system that would become a model for conservation. Um, and so, yes, this is where our, these are where our animals are now, uh, you know, where they are mostly find their habitats, right? So um, there's about 230 million acres in all of parks, but despite all of these measures, we still continue to see the loss of species. Um, we have conservation groups such as the Audubon Society, the Sierra Club, the National Wildlife Federation. But despite that, the species 
um, continue to dwindle and parks are not enough. And it comes down to how do we treat our private land and can we make up some of this deficiency in our own private um, landscapes? And the answer is, of course, yes. So there's some cool things here that is, are going on across the world to try and address this issue. We have wildlife corridors. Uh, you can see in these pictures, just gorgeous here in Florida. Um, these are to help animals to be able to move from different land masses that we've cut off by putting in those agricultural lands, by putting in um, neighborhoods and highways that, again, have benefited us greatly, but we need to remember our wildlife, right? So here in Holland, Banff National Park in Canada, Montana, France, they're making these beautiful intersections so that animals can cross over and still be able to access the different uh, land masses that, that they wouldn't otherwise be able to. So let's talk about the benefits of natives. Well, benefits of natives are they, they're food for wildlife, okay? They introduce biodiversity that is so important to nature. Um, they help us conserve water and we use less chemicals when we use natives. So in addition to being heart, more hardy plants, because they are so well adapted to our climate, remember they're gonna be adapted because this is where they originate from. Natives have less disease, they have less insect pressures than non-natives. That means we use less chemicals, we will use less insecticides, we will use less fungicides and herbicides because natives are more vigorous and they can stand up to these pressures naturally. Additionally, natives offer the biodiversity needed in nature to support large ecosystems, including all parts of the natural food web. Natives can also help with watershed. They can stabilize our soils and they help us conserve water. The natural food web is built on the presence of native plants. Insects depend on native plants as a food source and they cannot thrive without them. 80 to 90% of our landscapes, again, are composed of non-native plants, which most insects are unable to use. So in turn, insects are the major sources for many of other forms of wildlife, such as birds and other mammals. And so without insects, the food web deteriorates. You didn't realize how important those insects were, right? Well, they are. So, with natives, again, you're gonna use less. You're gonna use less chemicals. If you look at these pictures here, of course, I know many of you out there, you probably have bird feeders and um, bird baths out in your yard, right? Because you you enjoy looking at nature. We all enjoy. You know, Jeff's talking about uh, forest bathing. That sounds so awesome to me. And we do have to reconnect with nature, but we can all do that in our own homes by putting in native plants that draw in those birds. You know, so I have a picture here of uh, a nut all oak. Uh, it, it turns out that oaks are actually very versatile. Uh, they attract as so many different types of caterpillars. I want to say it's in the hundreds. So if you ever want to attract those types of um, you know, caterpillars and birds, put some oaks in your lawn. Uh, so this this picture here on on my left is is nut all, and then this one is a completely defoliated dogwood plant that the caterpillars have gotten a hold of. And I choose not to. Um, use insecticides because I understand that it's th the plants are going to survive. They're going to be fine and they're going to flush out new leaves. Uh, but I enjoy seeing, you know, look at all these cute little pictures of the birds with the caterpillars in their mouth. So caterpillars, it turns out, are a very good source of nutrition for birds. And what do all of these caterpillars eat? Well, of course, they eat our, um, our plants. And um, again, they love native oaks, like nut all oaks, red oaks, white oaks, heck, any type of oak, okay? All right. So on top of that, if you're not very interested in the caterpillars, maybe you're interested in the butterflies. Many of our host plants uh, support the caterpillars that turn into the beautiful butterflies that we just love to eat. Some caterpillars are general 
generalist eaters, meaning that they will feed on several different types of trees. And then we have specialists such as the monarch, right? That only feeds on milkweed uh, or the Gulf fritillary. They love passion vines. So not only will you attract caterpillars, but you, when you attract those caterpillars, those can turn into those beautiful butterflies that we all just enjoy seeing. Um, now, on top of that, natives can help us save water, okay? Water is our most precious natural resource. And according to the EPA, Americans use 29 billion uh, gallons per day, Americans <laughs> in general, everyone, um, gardening and for lawn care that amounts, that counts for about 8.5 billion or 30% of water use. Now, the average American home consumes 58,000 gallons of water just for irrigation in their, in their lawn. Two thirds of the world's population, according to the United Nations, United Nations is projected to face water scarcity by 2025. So this is something that we have to address and we can do it by utilizing native plants. So, Here's what I suggest. You, you, you use native plants, use drought tolerant plants. You can use non-natives, you can use natives. I don't want anybody to think by me giving this talk that I'm not a proponent for non-natives. There are many varieties and cultivars of, of plants uh, that are non-native that are gorgeous. And I think that you can use both in harmony in your lawn to create a beautiful landscape, but also support local ecosystems. So remember, native and drought tolerant plants, once they're established, they typically survive survive well on their own with just rainfall. So this is just a, a short list of drought tolerant plants. Pull out your smartphones if you want to take a picture of this. Uh, also, it, it will be posted if you are interested in, in seeing some of these lists that I pop up. Take too long to go through all of them. So the next thing I want to say is, Go easy on the turf, okay? By reducing the area that is established with turf grass, it will significantly reduce the amount of water your landscape needs. Lawns require a great deal of water um, to keep them looking just the perfect lawn, you know, like my blue heaven. So this helps us conserve water. It will reduce your water bills and it reduces mowing costs and it conserves your time. You know, I. I'd love to give my husband back an hour of his life every week by not cutting the lawn, by establishing more beds, which he hates because <laughs> he has to weed eat around them. That's why I'm just trying to convert the whole lawn into flower beds. So here's what I'm saying. Make a difference with your landscape. Uh, I give I need to give photo credit and slide credit to Tammany on this one. She, she shared these photos with me. Uh, these are landscapes that are incorporating natives. They're using less um, grass. So lessen your footprint, provide ecosystem services, add diversity to your landscape, and mow a little less. Who couldn't use a little more time on their hands? Um, take a large portion of your turf grass lawns and turn them into beds. Reduce the amount of time you spend cutting grass. Take your time back. Use less fossil fuel, fuels. Use less water. Lawns consume more water than any other of the uses of water that we have in our home again. So when you recognize that through your actions, you become part of the solution instead of part of the problem, it's very rewarding. By choosing a diversity of plants uh, and what landscape designers and Arthur Rick Dark refers to as organic architecture, you can provide um, the opportunity to return your roots to the natural world. Native plants can also be used um, for rain gardens. We have lots of plants since we're in this. Remember, we got to understand where we came from in order to understand where we are now, right? We we live in a, in a place where um, we do get a lot of rain. We do have a lot of coastal areas. We do have a lot of marsh. So, so what does that do? That means we have a lot of standing water, right? We can create uh, rain gardens using utilizing natives. So rain gardens um, absorb water from rain events, 
like the one that we're going to have later today. Thank you, Sally. Um, they provide flooding and puddling prevention. They dry out quickly enough to present, uh, prevent mosquito reproduction. They absorb and process stormwater. They keep pollutants uh, out of local waters and increase the groundwater recharge. They reduce the amount of water going to treatment plants. And then in turn, it reduces the emissions from those plants. Combined uh, sewer system communities save from reduced sewer overflows. They provide habitat and food for pollinators and other animals. And they are thought to um, increase your property value by two to eight percent. So, hey, throw a rain garden in. Um, it, it can be an aesthetic thing and, and it has environmental benefits as well. So in, in those places, we, we utilize native plants in rain gardens as well. These, um, now a rain garden is just a depression of earth that is filled with a mixture of sand, topsoil, and compost. It filters the water. It's typically six to nine inches deep. And again, the runoff from paved surfaces like your driveways or gutters and downspouts will be collected there. And you can utilize native, native plants adapted to wet conditions, such as um, buttonbush or swamp mallow, Louisiana iris, just gorgeous, blue-eyed grass, black-eyed Susans, and so on can be utilized in those areas. And you're not only doing something for the environment, you're also putting something beautiful in your lawn. Now you also, to conserve water, I wanna suggest that you group plants together with similar water needs. Lawns will require more water. Um, and so you wanna reduce your, your lawn. You wanna group plants uh, according to their water needs that creates hydrozones and it reduces the water according to those zones. So what do we think is going on with our native plants? They're gonna require less. So we bunch of some native plants together. We don't need as much irrigation there. Perhaps when we have drought, we're gonna focus that on our larger trees um, and shrubs that perhaps need it. Um, but we wanna group plants together in hydrozones to help us conserve water. All right, so let's get into some of the, some of the plants that are native to Louisiana, native to the Americas. Now all of these, for I know there are so many great groups out there that focus on natives. And I'll be honest here and make a confession, you, you all might know a whole lot more natives than I do. Um, I tend to end up in an office and, and less in nature than I should be, but um, there are so many natives out there that are available for us to use and um, that have been tried and true and used and are adapted to our areas. So this is just a, a gorgeous picture. Our last one was one of non-natives, but here we have some, some pictures of native plants to the Americas that we can utilize in our lawns. Now, let's start with the Louisiana super plant. It is, if you don't know what the Louisiana super plant program is, let me briefly tell you that um, we call it university tested and industry approved. Is that right, Jeff? Uh, this is, these are plants that we're using in landscape trials um, that we evaluate for several years that we say do well in our landscape. So, you know, it might be a no brainer to use natives, right? And, and I think now as time goes on with this program that you will see more natives because again, they're adapted to this area and they perform well here. Um, so willow oak, Quercus phyllos, uh, native to this area, zones five through nine, it'll get about 40 to 75 feet, spreading 25 to 50 feet. These do well in full sun to partial sun. Um, they'll do wet, uh, their water requirements are medium to wet. I have several willow oaks in my, my lawn that are actually dropping leaves right now because, well, we are going into fall, but they, they got pretty dried out. Um, it doesn't seem like we're not getting enough rain, but we are getting less rain. Uh, they're very low maintenance. You can use them as shade or street trees, and you can use these in your rain garden to help you um, absorb some of those storms, uh, the, the rain and water. They tolerate clay soils, which my entire backyard is clay soil and 
You know, a lot of plants do not do well in that environment, but willow oaks do. So they, they do well in clay soils, wet soils, and they're great at sequestering um, air pollution. Live oaks, we can't go anywhere without saying live oaks. Now, live oaks may not be something that you would utilize for your lawn if you do not have a large enough space. These do get very large, but what says the South more than a live oak, right? Um, these grow well here in Louisiana. They'll get about 40 to 80 feet. They grow very vigorously at first and then they slow down and these trees can live for hundreds of years and they are just gorgeous. Um, they can tolerate uh, medium to wet, they, they require medium to wet areas. Uh, they require, what am I trying to say? They need water people. <laughs> They're medium maintenance. maintenance. Um, you can use it as a shade tree, but I'm not so sure if I want to make the recommendation for a street tree. It, it, it can be, but sometimes when we use those things, when we use live oaks in that manner, we have to trim up the tree into an unnatural form. And so I just, I'm not trying to tell anyone, tell anyone not to use live oaks. I just want you to be Think in the future before you plant it, right? These trees are going to, going to get very large. Um, they tolerate clay soil, wet soil, and salt sprays. Um, you know, there's the, the National Live Oak Forest in Pensacola. Our naval ships were once built from the hardwood of live oaks. In fact, the USS Constitution survived the American Revolution and it was called Old Ironsides and it was made of live oaks. And what says LSU more than, than the beautiful live oaks that are on our campus? So I have to, to give them credit, but remember when we're utilizing these in the landscapes, we need to have large areas. Uh, sassafras um, isn't just fun to say, it's also pretty. Um, this, this is a natural plant. I mean, this is a native plant to our area. It'll get about 30 feet in height, 60 feet in width. They, they will grow well in full to partial shade, uh, full sun to partial shade. All of these natives, I, I don't even know why I put the maintenance on here to be quite frank, because they all do not require very much maintenance at all. They're not gonna require fertilizing. You may have to prune every now and then. Remember when the caterpillars come in and the birds and the squirrels come in, that's exactly what we're going for, right? So these do well in sandy upland soils and they're wild, they're wildlife food. And you all know that the roots um, were very important at one time for making root beer, although I don't believe that we're doing that anymore. It has been found that <laughs> this is a carcinogen, like many things, um, but it's also used in flavoring gumbo. We make gumbo filet from sassafras, um, and some people boil the root down into a tea. These have been used for medicines for years by native people. Uh, the red bay tree, another one that we're all familiar with, uh, does well here. Uh, it gets about 40 feet, 20 feet wide, full sun to partial shade. Um, it can be used as a great shade tree and also another one of those rain trees. They do well in sandy low woodlands and swamps and they're great wildlife food. They make some berries uh, and they're used as a spice in cooking, right? Swamp red maple, okay, this one's gorgeous. Um, Medium-sized tree, provides gorgeous fall color. This is a maple that is underused as a native tree here, I feel, and I, I brought some examples. Um, I don't know if everybody can see that, maybe I'll show you all in a little bit, but these are all native plants that I have behind me, and I did bring one of the, the swamp red maples. They're actually very easy to start from seeds. And the one that I brought here was actually started this year by the Horticulture Club at LSU. And I've just bumped it up several times. And this one has just a vigorous um, growth rate. So if you guys are needing a, a plant that you wanna use in the in the lawn that you want a shade tree that th that's there yesterday, right? Cause you wanna shade everything. This is one of your plants. All, also um, tulip poplar is another great a deciduous tree that can be utilized as a shade tree that grows very quickly. Um, what else do we want to say about this? You know, all, all of these trees and shrubs, it's a great time to plant them in the fall, in the winter. 
uh, in the spring. We try not to suggest planting in the summertime just because of heat um, and, and more maintenance on your part. They can survive, but you're going to do a whole lot of watering. Give them a break. Give yourself a break. Wait till the fall. Um, and they're adapted to a, a, a variety of soils. We've got the evergreen sweet bay magnolia, another underutilized tree. I think this one's great as a landscape plant. It's evergreen. It has small white fragrant flowers, um, does well in full sun to part shade, and um, it has showy red fruit. And the undersides of the leaves are kind of a silver tint. The bark is a silver tint that is just very gorgeous. So all those things add aesthetic value to our to our lawns, um, not just being a shade tree and something to throw up uh, in the lawn. It's it can have all these beautiful aesthetics. It tolerates clay soil, wet soil, and uh, air pollution. Bald cypress, okay. Louisiana super plant, fall super plant for 2020. We all know this plant, right? This is our state tree. It's a gorgeous deciduous conifer. Um, it's very, it's slow growing and long lived. It'll be around for a while. Now, just like the live oak, I will have to caution you about the knees. Um, I think that people get very um, nervous about those knees in their lawn. You know, we don't want to encroach on our neighbors lawns and, and we don't want to break up concrete. However, not every cypress tree is going to produce a knee. Um, we don't really understand fully what the knees are for. It's thought that they provide oxygen to the roots and they help to anchor those trees in those marshy swampy areas. However, these can be planted and they're tolerant of drought um, dry areas. And so those heavy clay soils, they'll grow there as well. And if you're worried about uh, mowing them over with the lawnmower, don't worry about it. You know, those knees can be cut and the tree will survive. So again, just be cognizant when you're planting this ball cypress. It, it's wonderful for so many reasons. First of all, it's one of the best plants we have for fall color change. And then those uh, beautiful needles that fall and blanket the, the ground, they're just another beautiful thing in the lawn in fall. And of course, they can be utilized in your rain garden. Now, um, wild turkey, wood ducks, water birds, and squirrels, they use this as wildlife food. Um, they're habitats for bald eagles. I don't know how many of you drive from to the New Orleans airport. Me and my family have this um, habit of looking for the eagle's nest out in the cypress trees on our way there. It's just so much fun, you know, to look at that. They're homes for toads, frogs, salamanders. Of course, the timber is very valued for the rot-resistant heartwood. Um, and it, it provides wetlands sta stability, soaking up floodwaters and preventing erosion, and they trap pollutants. So again, natives can help us um, stabilize our soils, which is a, a pretty big concern here in Louisiana. All right, let's move to shrubs, and I'll move a little bit quicker because I think we need to get through this. But there are lots of beautiful shrubs that we can utilize out there for our lawn. Um, American Beautyberry, is, again, is another Louisiana super plant, just gorgeous. Uh, it's a deciduous shrub. It's very open and airy. Uh, it, its form it is just gorgeous, and it does well as an understory plant, meaning, as you can see here in this bottom right photo, this is on campus at LSU. They've utilized American Beautyberry very heavily, and um, it's here underneath the live oak trees. It makes some very small flowers in the spring that turn into berries in the fall, and it, it just brings another beautiful aesthetic to your lawn. I don't know, can everybody see this? Okay, Haley, I know you want to zoom in. Um, it, this is the American Beauty Berry. Now, these are gorgeous berries, and birds like these, right? So for all our birders out there that want to draw birds into their lawn, this is an excellent selection. And, you know, it's very tolerant of all sorts of soils. Um, again, benefits our ecosystem services and for our wildlife. We got Henry Garnet, Virginia Willow. That's another Louisiana super plant. Uh, you want to, it grows about four to five feet tall. They have white flower panicles early to mid spring. They 
they flower for about four to six weeks. They're they're great in woodland gardens. They they like filtered sun and shade. They make a beautiful another fall foliage change, garnet, crimson, maroon for for the fall. I'm sorry about breathing on this <laughs> microphone, everybody. Um, but it is deciduous. Um, if we don't get a very cold winter, it could be semi evergreen. Um, and but there's no major disease issues with this plant. I believe that there has been some uh, leaf spot on this, but it's not nothing of major concern. Um, this is another small sh uh, small shrub or small tree or shrub. Let's call it that. Uh, it's deciduous. This is called the two wing silver bell and you might have a hard time locating this plant, uh, but it's definitely a gorgeous native and if you can get your hands on it, you really should. Uh, it, it enjoys full to part sun and very low maintenance, does well in a rain garden and it has those beautiful fragrant white bell shaped flowers that the that attracts birds. Just gorgeous. Swamp rose mallow uh, or the hardy hibiscus is an herbaceous perennial. Um, does well here. It'll bloom from July to September. It'll bloom more if we have it in the full sun. You can use it in a rain garden and it comes in a variety of different colors. It's deer resistant for those of you who might live out in the country and have lots of deer around um, or so it said um, and it tolerates wet soil. So it could be an, an option for a rain garden here. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Schiller's Delight Viburnum. Uh, this is an evergreen sh shrub, another Louisiana super super plant, and I like to use it as a replacement for Indian hawthorn. Indian hawthorn gets leaf spot um, very often and, you know, will drop its leaf and won't do as well. I think this is a, a great substitute because it's an evergreen with uh, flowers and it'll tolerate poor soils. It's a it's one tough plant. All right, so then we got herbaceous perennials and forbs. Oh my goodness, the possibilities are endless. We have cardinal flower, Louisiana phlox, Texas star hibiscus. This is a white um, one here that Bob Mirabello has planted up at LSU. Echinacea, rutabecchias, lizard tail, that's another great one, and uh, Louisiana irises for wet areas or rain gardens, so consider using those. Then we've got all of our native vines, um, American wisteria, cross vine, coral honeysuckle, passion flower, which, you know, is another, we talked about the Gulf Fritia, Fritillary, <laughs> as you can see in this picture, it's, it's the host plant. Um, then we have grasses, sedges, and rushes, which I believe are underutilized. They're just gorgeous and they add excellent texture to your landscapes. Um, large plantings make an impact statement in your landscape. I, I especially love the pink mooley grass that we have here. So in the fo photo, we have river oats, we have white top sedge, mooley grass, uh, both the white and the pink, and then we have the, the blue arrow rush. So how about less of this lawn mowing, you know, seeing this on the on the highway and how about a little bit more of this where these wildflowers are in Texas or Cajun prairie land. It's a lot prettier than seeing people mow down all these grasses. How about instead of using uh, Indian azaleas, we use, well that should be indica, not indicum. Sorry guys. Um, it should, why not try some of our native azaleas such as flame azalea, honeysuckle azalea, swamp azaleas. These are all native and remember these are going to be uh, less prone to disease and insects because they are adapted to our area. How about instead of crepe myrtles we use eastern red, red buds. You know crepe myrtle bark scale has become so rampant across the Gulf states. Maybe we should start considering using natives in place of, of some of these um, these plants. Instead of little leaf boxwood that has boxwood blight and bo boxwood dieback, why not use dwarf yopon? These can be made into a hedge just as easily as a, a little leaf boxwood could. Um, 
How about instead of Bradford pears or the calorie pear that has weak wood and often breaks and, and doesn't live very long, although the white flower is very gorgeous and, and the shape of the tree is gorgeous, why not try one of our natives like Grancy Graybeard, the fringe tree? Or why not, like I said, instead of Indian hawthorn, try Mrs. Schiller's Delight Viburnum. So there's a lot of great resources out there. Like I said, um, the Native Plant Initiative of Greater New Orleans, the LSU Ag Center, uh, there's the Louisiana Native Plant Society, Acadiana Native Plant Project. You can't get enough resources from the Ottoman, the National Ottoman Society. We have the Capital Area Native Plant Society. If you're interested in learning about the Cajun Prairie Habitat Preservation Society, you can visit all these websites and find out more information. And there's so many plant groups, you know, Facebook plant groups that you can get on. It's a it's a wealth of knowledge, and and this is a community of people that just really care about our ecosystem, our world, making a difference and um, utilizing natives. Um, our wildlife populations are in decline because native plants that they depend on are fast disappearing. What's part of the solution? Plant more natives. Uh, there's this book by Douglas Tallamy. It's called Nature's Best Hope, A New Approach to Conservation That Starts in Your Yard. It's an excellent book. Um, he, he takes the next step uh, kind of grassroots approach to conservation, saying that homeowners everywhere can turn their yards into con conservation corridors that provide wildlife habitats. Um, it, it puts that initiative on you, it, on the private individuals, to, to take that torch and try to, to make a difference. And you all can by, by just changing a couple of things in your lawn and incorporating more natives. So we're gardening for birds and pollinators with native plants. Um, there's also one more thing I wanted to tell you all about the Louisiana Certified Habitat. Uh, this is actually Anna Timmerman in this picture. She's one of our county agents. Um, a master's student at LSU. She works very hard. Um, her and Tammany are big proponents of natives. They, they work with Grow Native and the Louisiana Certified Habitat. You can earn these plaques that you can put in your yard by incorporating natives into your plant, into your lawns. 25 native plants or 25% uh, is bronze level. Silver is 50, gold is 75. Just whatever your goal is to make a difference. It can be small. Every little bit helps. And uh, that's about all I have for everybody today. Hopefully that's good timing. And if you guys have any questions, again, I have lists of, actually, Anna, we're working on a native plant publication right now. We're working with Renewable Natural Resources um, and the Department of uh, the Horticulture Department at LSU are working to create, because more people are interested in incorporating natives into their lawn, um, these are some lists of trees, shrubs, vines, grasses, ground covers, and of course, dozens of wildflowers that can be used in your lawn. And um, okay, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions you guys have. April sent in the question. She just transplanted a beauty berry from the woods and she wanted to know if there were any tips in order to get it going. Right now, you just need to make sure that um, when you transplant that you water those roots in very well so that we help um, make more new roots. They will go through some transplant shock, but those plants are very, um, they're very hardy, of course. So you just want to make sure, now you don't want to waterlog them, right? Because you can cause fungus, um, it'll root rot. You want to have just the right amount of water. So just make sure that you stay on top of that. They'll have time to establish during this time. And uh, that's great that you did that. Um, someone asked. Oh. I'm not really sure on that, to be honest with you. You know, there are pond cypress all over the place, uh, especially on campus. I honestly haven't noticed too many knees. I don't know if there's actual research out there, but that's a good question. Um, I didn't repeat that. Pond cypress, someone's asking if they produce less knees than, than a bald cypress. And I have to admit, I'm not really sure. Uh, Jeff, what do you think?
Okay. All right. Dr. Keeney says, so they say, but we're not really sure. I'm sure much like the bald cypress, if you need to cut those down, um, the tree will survive. Uh, it's just part of the, the tree, right? Jerry? Jerry had a question about transplanting uh, native trees. He's tried several different types of native trees and not been successful. Um, I'd start with a soil test. I mean, I know that I say that most of these uh, do well in every type of soil, but each plant is an individual, right? And, and each soil is, is a little bit different. So you might want to start with that. Uh, transplant shock from, from these, you're going from containers to, to the lawn. You know, watering in is, is the, you got to get them established first. Once they're established, I think that they do okay, but you're saying you're having a hard time with that. And that's a hard thing to answer when I'm telling you all that natives do well here, right? So Dr. Keeney saying that if you're going to bare root the plant, you want to do that in the winter time. It's hard to get them established, especially when you're transplanting them or moving them, right? Um, out of na native ha habitat. Now, again, you also got to consider the source of the plant material. So maybe if they're root bound, pot bound, you know, it, what what is the quality of the material that you're starting off with? This isn't answering your question. I'm very sorry, <laughs> but it, you don't give up. Keep trying, keep planting them. Um, you know, most of these again will do well in in full sun, partial shade. Uh, keep trying. <laughs> Paul is asking for walkable ground covers in the shade. Now let's see what I have on ground covers here. I have frog fruit, I have creeping spot flower, and we have maiden hair fern. I don't know if any of those are very walkable. Um, that is a tough one, but you know what, Paul? Um, if you want to put your email in the chat, I can look into that and make some suggestions. And Jerry, if you want to put your email in the in the chat, I can also try and work on some better tips for you on transplanting natives into your lawn. I had a question with the vegetative propagation of um, passion flower, having some issues with that. I don't know if you have anything against using root, rooting hormones, uh, possibly that could help, but I've, I've been able to, to take cuttings and just stick in a container mix and, and propagating, um, usually with no issues. Sometimes you can actually find smaller plants, kind of volunteer plants from the vines and lightly pull those up when they're small and tender, um, where they have, you know, most of their roots intact and transplant those. Um, yeah, and and make sure that that you're when you are trying to propagate that you're getting a node into the the media or into the ground that you are you're planting into. W's asking where's the best place to get native seeds? I'd say nature, from the flowers, from you know. Um, I don't know who sells if there are any native seeds. You could try wildflower meadows locally. I'm not sure on a seed so source, but there are quite a few um, groups out there on the internet that you can search and um, find those seeds. But uh, I've been pretty successful with harvesting seeds from the just out on a walk and, and getting them to start. So just being out there at the right time or you know, logging in or, or getting in these Facebook chats or in these Facebook pages with with native folks, they're so willing to share their seeds and their plants. So you, you could try that as well. Someone's asking uh, locally where they can get native plants. Um, Clegg's Nursery, Louisiana Nursery and uh, Baton Rouge are two local nurseries that carry a pretty big selection, pretty large selection of native plants, a lot of trees and shrubs. Um, and then also the Hilltop Arboretum, if you're looking for some interesting type plants, I've gotten quite a few things there. They're great at their plant cells for uh, having native plants. So that would be my recommendation. And then you can start, like I said, you can, uh, Arbor Day. 
I get trees from Arbor Day, a lot of the natives and start those from Arbor Day. So a lot of these that we have back here behind me, um, some of these were picked up at nurseries today, like this yarrow and the, the swamp milkweed that we have here and the passion vine. Um, beauty berries are available. The dwarf yopons are very available at local nurseries. Um, and again, some of these I started on my own, like the, the red swamp oak and some of these other oaks. Um, parsley hawthorn I have here, again, was started by the Horticulture Club at LSU. So in a lot of these instances, and I know that's always the question that everybody asks, is the availability, sometimes with super plants and sometimes with natives. They're not gonna be more available unless you make your voice heard. So when you go to those nurseries, ask for those plants. Um, they are available. I think that, you know, if there is a demand, more of a demand, that they will be more readily available. So keep asking, keep working with these groups, and, and, and that's the best way to get your hands on these native plants. Yes, the Audubon Society also has a list, and they, on their website, I put that up here, you can type in your zip code, and they'll actually make recommendations for native plants that you can, um, you can plant in your area. Could you describe if there are any difficulties with people using native plants? Okay, I see two difficulties. The first difficulty is availability, right? They're not as readily available as, as those plants that we're demanding, you know, the, the typical landscape plants that we utilize all the time. So it's going to be availability. Um, second of all, I think people have this aversion to kind of natural, we get in these, these ruts uh, where we want our lawns to look just perfect. Sometimes when we let nature take over, it's not so perfect. So I think people have a bit of an aversion to the natural look per se, but we have to change that mindset. And then the next question was, could we work with landscape architects in order to do that? Now, I don't mean to keep plugging Tammany here, but she is a landscape uh, architect and she utilizes quite a bit of natives. It's almost as if we have to make it our own personal mission to make this work. So again, if you if you want native plants and you care about the earth and you care about, you know, all these species, the demand has to be there and we have to change the mindset of people, you know, let's 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 make lawns ugly, right? Let's tell people that turf grass is ugly and that n n natives are the way to go and maybe we'll change the tide. But um, I had one more thing here. Almost Eden also offers quite a few natives that you can order online and it's delivered to you. So check out Almost Eden. They're, they're in Louisiana. So um, that's a great outlet or a great place for native plants. And that's it. Okay, good. Sorry, I think I'm, I went over a bit. Lots of good questions. Sorry if I didn't answer everybody. I really appreciate your time and letting me talk about this. And I hope that you all try to incorporate, again, non-natives, natives. Let's just um, put a few in there. You can make a difference. Okay, thanks. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we will be back again uh, next month for a surprise, re a surprise reflections. So uh, stay tuned again for more information on the events at Burden at the Botanic Gardens. Please go to our website, Google or search bar uh, LSU Ag Center Botanic Gardens and you will find us there. And also like to thank the friends of the Botanic Gardens for putting this event on. Thank you all. Have a good day.